there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. We're coming for you, banks. It's an exciting time to be involved in Bitcoin Cash at the moment. During that whole war fighting versus big blocks, like were we the bad guys? Were we the ones that went listening? Fundamentally, we believe in markets, transparency, and tokenization. Come on, you gotta come stronger than that, you know, like. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast. Following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency. This is episode number 100, Taking Back Bitcoin, featuring the one and only Roger Veer. Today is, I forgot to update the slides, look at that, Saturday, the 2nd of December, 2023. I'm your host, Jeremy. Jet is doing the producing in his nice new cleaned up uh, room so everybody can enjoy that <laughs> and our guest today is an og bitcoiner and the world's first investor in bitcoin startups if you don't know who he is there is ten thousand different interviews about how he got into bitcoin and all his backstory so we're going to save some time and not cover that here we'll just get straight onto the content but hello roger welcome to the show great to have you here how are you doing this evening or this morning yeah great Thank you guys so much for reaching out to me and uh, having me on here for the the hundredth episode. That's a that's a big commitment you guys have put in. So thank you guys for that. You are by far the number one most requested guest that we have ever <laughs> have ever had. Like sometimes people message me and say, "Oh, you should have this person or this person or this person," but you are by far throughout the run of the show. In fact, even when we did episode two or three, people were always like, "When are you going to have Roger on? When are you going to have Roger on?" <laughs> but no, we're probably going to do a bit more proof of work uh, before that. So. Anyway, glad we put in the work and I'm glad we could do it. Okay, so let's just quickly touch on the price like we all, always do. USD, $225.19 uh, of Bitcoin Cash. One BTC buys 171.9 BCH, which is down slightly. And one Ethereum buys 9.2 BCH, which is also flat. Given your experience in the cryptocurrency markets do you ever do any speculating how are you seeing the market these days uh I, for me the long term is the utility the actual usefulness in commerce to do things that's what drives the long-term price but with btc i think we just see a bunch of people speculating on speculating on future speculators and you know lightning doesn't work for payments btc doesn't work for any sort of reasonably sized payments like it's just people they you know you're welcome. I built up the brand name for you guys, and then the project got hijacked, uh, which I guess will lead us into one of our next our very next slide here. But the the project was hijacked. You're welcome for building up the brand name, but now it's Bitcoin's being used for a project that isn't the original Bitcoin at all. Uh, as and I can say that very clearly because I was around and watched the whole thing happen. And uh, you want to mention the next slide that we yeah, have? Yeah, 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 yeah. So our <laughs> first slide is called uh, "Taking Back Bitcoin," as you say. The brand name has carried BTC far further than I certainly ever uh, expected it would. But it just goes to show that getting a message out to 8 billion people, especially one as complicated as rewriting their entire financial system, is not that easy to do. So there is this classic war, uh, classic uh, book, the, the Block Size War, which I've actually just recently read and you actually appear in although i i believe you haven't read it from what i know so it sounds like you want to set the story straight and you're releasing your own book or maybe even two books right uh called taking back bitcoin so tell us what is this book about and when's it going to be out uh the goal is to have it out by around i guess the goal, original goal is to have it out this year, but I think it's going to be Q1 of, of next year. But it's 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 pretty much done at this point, and just giving it the final review uh, before it goes off to the publishers there. But basically, it's an entire history of everything that happened because most people, especially I, for the most part, history gets written by the victors. Well, you know, Bitcoin Cash lost the battle for the Bitcoin brand name, um, but I think it's still important that people know what actually happened and the amazing amount of censorship. That took place, and we're starting to hear in the media a little bit about the U.S. government, how they were lobbying, you know, the Twitter and Facebook and this and that and YouTube to censor all sorts of views. 
the exact same thing went on within Bitcoin. And so like we don't have actually we do have like some hard evidence too that like government agencies or at least government employees were involved in the censorship of Bitcoin. But I think a lot of people won't know just how clear and how deep the censorship was and what a giant, giant role it played in the hijacking of, of all of Bitcoin, the entire ecosystem. And people are all excited. Oh, Bitcoin's, you know, $38,000 or, it, you know, it hit $60,000 before. Ask yourself, like, that's what's seen. What's not seen is where it would have been if it hadn't been throttled and th- its usability in commerce been destroyed so that companies like Microsoft and Expedia and all these companies around the world stopped accepting Bitcoin in 2017. We, for the first time, had reverse adoption. So yeah, it's great. Okay, Bitcoin's $38,000 or whatever at the moment. Maybe it would have been $138,000 or $238,000 if it had literally been allowed to become money for the entire world. We wouldn't have to be dealing with this crazy high US dollar inflation that we've had for the last couple of years. People would have migrated to Bitcoin uh, and it would have, instead of a market cap of, uh, you know, whatever it is at the moment, it would have a market cap of multiple times that. And uh, that's what could have been if they hadn't intentionally destroyed Bitcoin, whether it was through, you know, people intentionally trying to do it to preserve the U.S. dollar or it was just a bunch of uh, not being so polite, useful idiots out there that uh, helped it along or unwitting accomplices, if I want to be a little bit more uh, polite on that front. But it was really, really frustrating to see. And so there's a whole book outlining the entire thing that's coming out uh, shortly here. So starting from 2009 or like your yes, involvement, so I guess, 2011? Okay, I'm, all right. It, it, it starts going into detail once I got involved, which was at the very end of 2010. I started paying attention. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but uh, through until 2023. Wow. Okay. Is this is it a long book? That's more than 12 years of, of it's, history. It's pretty there. long. So yeah. So, wow. Okay. So not in time for Christmas this year, but we can all look forward we'll to it in the new year. I mean, like you, I agree that I I want to have an optimistic vision that okay, if the big blockers had won out being such a close battle that things would be different but the way things have played out i also have this alternate history in my head which is where we maybe win that battle but we still a lot of those same stupid people would be heavily involved in the project right so i can sort of see like well maybe if bitcoin passed that test it would have just failed at the next one like maybe we got one block size raise in and it worked and then the next one didn't work or maybe they found some other, you know, way to sabotage the protocol or put something in. In hindsight, I sort of feel like the place BCH is at now, it almost couldn't have gone any other way because it was like the community couldn't just have a dream run from inception through to global reserve currency. There was always going to be a banking attack and a government attack, and it was always going to work to some degree. So the fact that we lost that one and then one versus BSV and one versus XEC but with a lot of pain as the community learned more and more lessons in hindsight, I sort of feel like maybe it was always destined to be this way. Do you think there's any credibility to that kind of idea? And and it's absolutely not over yet. And it's not just yes. around Bitcoin or BCH. It's around all of cryptocurrencies. Governments hate, hate anything that gives people control over their own lives. And they'll do anything they can, whether legal or illegal or openly or covertly, they'll do whatever they can to make sure that they get to control you and your finances and what you're up to. And that's why it's so important that we build these permissionless, uncensorable tools to empower people all over the planet to be able to do whatever they want with their own money without needing permission from governments. That's the entire point of crypto. And if you're in it just because you want to see the number go up, you've missed the the entire like benefit to the world. Like, yeah, it's nice when the number goes up, but the real benefit to the world is putting people in charge of their own money. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And as you know, important as it is that we're all working away on it every single day, it's been a truly enlightening experience for me to find how tuned out you know a a lot of people are that's been personally actually quite disappointing and maybe beforehand i was just naive i i don't know but i found that the more i get involved in bc like doing this podcast for instance that has really made a big difference in people i talk to taking it seriously before then when i just said no this is bitcoin this is great i was so excited about it but i didn't have some you know, proof of work that I could show them. Like I do this podcast. And the more and more yeah. Exactly. That's right. That's right. And so I, you know, and one other thing I've noticed about it, especially recently has been because I've been telling people about this now for, well, for over a decade, but with the podcast for about two and a bit years is that I've now had people start coming back to me and say, Hey, I'm kind of interested in crypto. Can you like, can you tell me more about that? Now I can just 
link them to it and they get straight onto it. But it's funny, it does even take that to, I had a friend complain to me about inflation the other day. And so I sent him the video that I made of us at Canary Wharf doing that rap about uh, inflation and et cetera. And he, he, at the time, he saw that and he thought it was funny and he laughed at it. And now he's like, wait, you were, you were completely right, right, you know? So we're just, it's more about, like you said, about the history books. It's about putting it in the history books and only in hindsight do people kind of, uh, you know, Sorry about uh, find the find the value in it. Is that what you found too? Or has everybody by this point in your life kind of woken up to what you've been trying to tell them this whole time? I, uh, I guess one other frustrating aspect is like a lot of times, like people didn't pay any attention. And then suddenly, like, you know, when Bitcoin hit $60,000 the last time, then everybody's contacting me saying, hey, how can I buy Bitcoin? It's like, I was telling you when it was a dollar, why did you wait until it got to $60,000? So, but that's that's life. And people love to, to chase a, a rising star. So, uh, yes. So I don't know what I, that's, that's just human nature, I suppose. And you're not going to be able to change that. Nothing we can do about it. Okay. So I guess not to like spoil the whole book or anything, but just, no, over let's the promote past. the whole book here. You're going to read okay. it, and if you don't know yeah, about yeah. the history of Bitcoin, you'll be, oh, my gosh, this happened, that happened. And even for people that have been around Bitcoin for a long, long time, uh, they'll still learn things that they probably weren't aware of. Uh, and so there are a number of researchers that helped me with the whole book, too. Uh, some of the wow. stuff that they got, they got was, oh, I had forgotten about that, or, oh, I didn't even know about that the first time around. So it was really interesting. And there's citations for everything, so nobody's going to be able to say, oh, you're making this up or making that up. And like a lot of the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that at the end of 2017, the average Bitcoin transaction fee was more than 50 US dollars, and the average confirmation time was more than two weeks. Right. And people like that just sounds crazy, but you can go and check the data. It's right there on the blockchain for anybody to see. Uh, it's crazy. And like, that's not usable as a currency, $50 in two weeks for your transaction to go through. And the, tr and the transaction can be reversed at any time in that two weeks. Like that is not peer to peer cash for the world in any sense of the word, but they yes. stole the Bitcoin domain name for it. Yes. No, that's it. And we're still paying to this day for that. So from the whole experience over the last more than a decade, is there anything that sticks out to you particularly as having been support? Because I've heard you say before as well, too, that in 2011, 2012, in that era, it felt like we're going to take over immediately because everybody was so enthusiastic, so aligned, and progress was so rapid that it seemed obvious that an ongoing exponential trend, and perhaps it would have, would have just taken over the whole world. But I don't know that anybody expected the attack to arrive in the in the form that it that it did was that just, the biggest thing of, that that was yeah. just one of many attacks though that wasn't that's not the only attack and so like uh, most people in crypto I mean, because there weren't many people around then in 2011 most people don't know what was going on but in june of 2011 the price of bitcoin and now everyone's excited because it moved from you know a hundred dollars to 200 and something dollars with bitcoin cash or 30,000, low 30,000 to high 30,000 pretty quickly. But in June of 2011, the price of Bitcoin went from like two or three dollars to thirty dollars, right? So a 10x increase. And it did that in like two weeks or something, a very short period of time. And that was kind of the first time Bitcoin got some worldwide media attention where the entire world like did some coverage of it. And the main discussion form at that time was bitcointalk.org. When Bitcoin hit $30 for the first time and everybody was starting to get interested, the forums got flooded with spam bots that were basically effectively shut down the forums so that nobody could talk about Bitcoin at that point. So this is as early as 2011, we saw an orchestrated intentional attack to shut down people being able to discuss Bitcoin when everybody was wanting to discuss Bitcoin. So like the attacks on Bitcoin, wherever that was coming from, have been going on since since it was in the single digits in terms of price. So like, uh, don't think they've stopped and they, they've been watching for a long time and don't think that those attacks are going, going to stop because this is really a threat to the way the entire world's power structures control all of humanity. And so that, that's what makes crypto so exciting because it empowers these individuals, but the people that want to control the world, they don't want to let that power go. And so they'll do anything they can to, to stop and, and control that. And, uh, you know, we saw, you know, CZ is going to probably be sentenced to prison here shortly for what providing a platform where people voluntarily were able to buy and sell different digital assets without permission necessarily from people that claim that they need to get their permission. That's a crazy, crazy world. And, uh, sad to see yeah well that's that's another element to this is anybody who is prominently involved is putting themselves at non-substantial you know substantial risk i would yeah. say anybody who's 
uh, publicly known or even anonymously. Obviously, that you know, Satoshi was a step ahead of the game right there. But in a the world we're in, there's no way that you could get any forward progress if everybody was all anonymous online. Right at a certain point, you just have to be out there saying what you believe and obviously various people have end up either dead or incarcerated along the way through a you know significant variety of means now you're one of the most prominent people in cryptocurrency history do you and have you over over time you know feared for your life or worried that you would be you know <laughs> attacked targeted physically or or otherwise yeah i'm not worried that i am I am being attacked. And so like some of it I can't talk about yet, but like one example of this, uh, and some of you guys maybe will know there's a, a YouTuber and an interesting, you know, libertarian type guy named Adam Kokesh, who has a great YouTube channel. I've enjoyed many of his videos over the years. And so for several years there, I was giving him a stipend every month so he could just continue making his YouTube videos uh, because I like the message that he's putting out there of, you know, voluntarism and self-ownership and, and running your own life. Uh, and so at some point, uh, and almost all Bitcoiners will know John McAfee also. So in, I think it was the 2020 election cycle, uh, John McAfee uh, and uh, Adam Kokesh ran for presidents and you know, vice president of the United States on the platform of, actually, I'm sorry, they ran for not president of the United States on the platform that if they were to win the election, they would just have an orderly dissolution of the entire federal government and just turn everything back over to the states and counties and city governments, right? So basically close down the federal government. And to me, that sounds wonderful. But I was donating money to him before he even announced his candidacy. I donated money to him the whole way through just for his YouTube channel. It wasn't paying close attention. It wasn't, you know, a large part of my monthly budget or anything each month. But then the United States Federal Election Commission, because I'm not a U.S. citizen and I renounced my citizenship back in 2014, they looked into prosecuting me for being a foreigner interfering in American elections where they would want to send me to jail over this is what they wanted to do. And apparent, simply for donating money each month for years to a guy who makes YouTube videos who ran for not president of the United States, I think they got like sixth place within the Libertarian Party nomination and then the eventual Libertarian candidate got like half a percent of the vote or something. So it's not like they came even close like – as much as I would have liked to have, for it to have been a serious campaign where they had a chance, it wasn't even remotely close. And uh, apparently they have like a tribunal where they decide whether or not to prosecute me for having given this guy money. And the tribunal deadlocked uh, with the, you know, uh, two to two. And apparently when it's a dread deadlock, the default is for them not to prosecute. And my initial reaction was like, oh, my God, I, that was so close. I'm glad I didn't get prosecuted for that and you know, get sent to jail for giving money to a guy for making YouTube videos. Uh and I and my other friend though had a much more interesting outlook is because I was scared. It was so close. It was deadlocked. He goes, no, 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 Roger, that's the best possible outcome. And I said, what do you mean that's the best possible outcome? He said that means you pissed off the maximum number of them that you possibly could, and there's nothing they can do about it. So, but that's just one example of uh, you know many attacks that they've had going on with me for years and years and years. And uh, I'm sick and tired of it. But uh, I want to own my own life, and I want everybody else to own their own life. So like. I'm not the extreme one. I just want people to leave everybody else alone and deal with each other on a voluntary basis. What we have now is the extreme system where a small group of people think they get to boss around everybody else and tell them what they can or can't do. And if you don't obey them, uh, they'll send you to jail, just like they're doing with CZ at the moment. Really sad to see. And just like they did with uh, Ross Ulbricht in the past and uh, a number of other people. If they're trying to do it, the tornado cash uh, developers, like – Anybody and everybody, if you say things like what I'm saying right now, they want to come after you. And uh, the lawyers that I have helping me with all this, too, they told me very clearly, Roger, they hate your Twitter account. So go ahead and follow me on Twitter, at Roger K. Veer. But he's, they told me specifically that they hate my Twitter account. And I've been very quiet on Twitter the last couple of years, mostly because I'm kind of scared, right? Like I don't want to poke the bear that much more. But like I also feel like – this message is really, really important to see and or, and hear because there's lots of other people out there that maybe they feel like they're all alone in the world, thinking that the you know government's just the biggest mafia in an area, bossing everybody around with threats of violence and extorting them. But you're not the only one. There's lots of us out there. And just look look at who just got elected in uh, Argentina a couple of days ago and the things he's saying. Wow! If you think my uh, Twitter account is wild, the things <laughs> I'm saying. Wow, like, well, Look at that guy, like even, even more, even better and more exciting than what I'm saying. So more power to him. We'll see if he follows through, but I'm, I'm pretty excited and optimistic about that. And maybe that'll set the set the tone for the rest of the world there too, when people see just how good things can be when government gets the heck out of the way and allows people to deal with each other voluntarily uh, in, in freedom and peace.
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, being sort of the good guys, as it were, I feel like it's the same as in the, the movies, you know, the good guys, they just have a limited set of resources and they never know just what weapons or problems or whatever the bad guys are going to, like, put in the mix, right? So it sort of seems to me that the only strategy is kind of strength in numbers is that they can't, they're going to get a few of us, it's just how it's going to go. And, like, in being involved, you just hope to inspire more and more and more people and at some point we hit a tipping point, right? That's the only way I can I can see this working out. So, yeah, for anybody who is publicly out there, building on crypto or, or spreading the message you know <laughs> thank you and the more people that do it ironically the less risky it becomes for everyone else because it just becomes pointless to go after any you know uh, key sort of players or, or whatever right so yeah I, I think that's really that's really something important that we can all contribute to now i wanted to ask you about a few of these uh key players that have been throughout cryptocurrency history that i'm sure you've met and know uh, you know personally and and so forth and just in reflecting on the entire history of, of bitcoin these are some of the most important people that i'm actually really here curious to hear your take on them so it's just one by one uh just quick a couple sentences your view on these people andreas antonopoulos amazing orator um but a little bit of a intellectual coward sometimes uh so one example of this like Andreas kind of, for the most part, was quietish on the scaling debate and like didn't take, I think, as good as a strong a stance as he should have. But the, at one point, a conference organizer invited uh, Andreas to have a on stage debate with myself about this exact topic. And they, the organizer asked me, are you willing to do it? I said, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, not only did Andreas not accept the invitation, he told the conference organizer that if they even allow me at the conference, he won't attend. And that just seems really like intellectually cowardly to me. And like, and you know, I'm not going to hit him. We're just going to have a, an intellectual discussion and debate. And for him to like cower away from that was really disappointing because he's someone that he's exciting to listen to. He is an amazing orator. He's done an amazing job of explaining Bitcoin and, and complicated concepts in simple enough ways for people to understand. He's done an absolutely fantastic job of that. Uh, and a lot of people actually don't know this. Like uh, I gave him his, I believe it was his first Bitcoin job. I paid him in Bitcoin for quite a while to help uh, with uh, various things at, uh, at blockchain.info before it became .com, like way back in the day. So I know Andreas personally, but uh, it was disappointing to, to see that. And I think, uh, and I can't speak too much directly for him, but uh, he seems to have bought in a little bit into like the wokeness stuff and uh I don't know, women equality, pushing it like more than what it actually should be. You should just treat everybody as an individual and like, that's it. But I, I, I seem to recall that he had some real kind of overly, uh, overly aggressive requirements for different, uh, different uh, conferences in regards to like gender roles at the Ratings conference and stuff like, like that. that. Yeah. Whereas for me, I just like anybody can do whatever they want. So, and, and, uh, and, and go for it. And as long as you're not hurting anybody, Go for it. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think at the time, you know, he was one of, you know, possibly the most prominent uh, voice uh, along with, you know, yourself uh, and maybe someone like Eric uh, up there, you know, and really the fact that he did just shy away from that. It, it could have all tipped right there if he'd been a bit more forthright. And I, it's hard to say what he truly does or doesn't believe because he's smart enough to, I think have self-censored himself uh, in quite a lot of scenarios, but it's hard for me to believe that he wouldn't have known because he, he knows what Bitcoin is and he's a, he's a dev. You can't, he's not the kind of person that could be easily fooled by technology doesn't get better. And we, so we, that we, always... we've seen it happen quite, quite a few times where people choose to say what's popular rather than what's true. Uh, and not just in the crypto field, but in all sorts of things. And so I, I think maybe Andreas and is an example of someone saying what's popular rather than what's true. Uh, another fantastic example of someone that just says things that's popular and makes you know people like, you know, give them a pat on the back rather than what's true is that uh, Charlie Shrem. Really yeah. disappointing uh, for me. I was his first investor in, uh, in BitInstant. When they prosecuted him, I stood up for him publicly saying, hey, he's done nothing wrong. It's the prosecutors to the bad guys for sending him to jail. And when he got out of jail, he you know had a choice in the scaling debate too. And he could say what was true and what he knew was right or he could say what would make him popular and he chose to say what would make him popular. That was really disappointing uh, for me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I know he d still does some podcasts and stuff. Now I checked in on it and I even tried to sort of 
just debate him or stir him up a little bit in the comments, but he he never wrote back. And yeah, I can I can see why it's never never fun. Maybe he can make the same he can make the same uh, complaint to about me that I made about Andreas Santopoulos because to Charlie's credit, he invited me onto his podcast. Uh, but at this point, I don't really have many warm feelings towards him for having basically turned his back on the, the original peer to peer cash version of Bitcoin and just saying what's popular rather than what's true. So I, I declined his invitation to go on his podcast. So maybe he can. Uh, make the same complaint that uh, I just made about Andreas. He can make that about me, but uh, it was really disappointing to see people, uh, you know, do what's popular rather than what's true. And I've always been some, and that's why I was in Bitcoin so early. Bitcoin wasn't popular, but I knew it was going to be true. And so I went out there and stuck my neck out uh, for Bitcoin early on. And I stuck my neck out for the, the truth about Bitcoin and the scaling roadmap and how Bitcoin got hijacked by a bunch of people who are openly hostile to the, the idea of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. They openly say that they want the fees to be high, and they openly say that they want the transactions to be slow and unreliable for uh, on-chain transactions. Like, that sounds like crazy talk, but if you go and look at what they say, that's absolutely what they say. And it seems like, you know, some other people are finally now, years after you know, myself and others rang the alarm bell, people are now kind of starting to wake up a little bit that, oh, lightning's a joke. And falling apart, and that on scale scaling, on chain scaling really works uh, really really well. And that was, lo and you know, surprise. That was the plan from day one for Bitcoin. It's right there <laughs> by Satoshi himself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Eric Eric Voorhees. What about him? Yeah, an another person. I think that like a uh, amazing orator, amazing communicator, amazing writer. Like just really really has an amazing set of talents there, but. Uh, I think he chose to say what was more popular than, rather than what was uh, true, uh, specifically in regards to the, you know, the, the scaling wars that went on within Bitcoin. And nowadays, like many people, he's much more focused on Ethereum, and that's just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I think you know, we should focus on whatever is useful to people around the world. But uh, even Eric knows, like BTC, yeah, I guess it's, you know, number goes up, but like, that's not the thing to be building on. He's you know, built his business uh, shapeshift around, uh, around Ethereum, not around Bitcoin. And so it would have been nice to have seen him speak out a bit more for what was true rather than what uh what made what him popular and all that. but you know it's his yes. life he can say what he wants so okay the one person on this list that i guess you might maybe have a positive take on jihan um jihan's done an amazing amount for the community uh but i'm in the process of suing his company matrix port and having it put into liquidation because he hasn't paid me the money that he owes me uh so like really sad to see that happen so uh, jihan owes me millions and millions of dollars and uh he's refused to pay me so far uh really disappointing to see jihan do that and so like maybe that'll bring us into i, I know it's one of the the future topics here but in, in regards to coinflex uh we can go into more detail on that now or, or later but uh long story short is coinflex lied to everybody lied to me cheated everybody cheated me cheated jihan they destroyed the entire smart bch ecosystem they lied to everybody saying that they were suing me when the truth was that i was suing them and that they were the defendant the entire time but there was a non-disclosure clause there so i wasn't even allowed to talk about it so i had to stay quiet the whole time while mark was out there running his mouth lying to the entire world and i just had to stay quiet well now everything's done they settled with me they agreed that they owe me hundreds of millions of dollars uh we'll see how much there's still a few more lawsuits that are going to take place so i can't go into all the exact details there but uh really disappointed uh disappointed to see jihan uh initially and i think now he know jihan knows that he got fooled and lied to by coinflex but uh it's really you know as mark twain said it's easy to fool a man it's almost impossible to f convince a man that, so he's been that he has been fooled yeah uh, and something along those lines and i think that was the case with jihan he got fooled by coinflex uh and mark there but he's he's uh he's not admitting that he's been fooled and he needs to do the right thing and give me my money back all right and anybody yeah. if you're using matrix port and their products like i'm in the process of suing them and you know maybe they'll be put into liquidation here soon so i advise you get your money out of matrix port right here right away if you don't want to get caught up in that liquidation uh and jihan yes. uh, if you watch this or when someone sends you the link just send me my money and do the right thing and uh if you really want to be a good man you can apologize to me for believing the lies from coinflex now that i won the lawsuit against them and i'm sorry to clarify they settled the lawsuit with me. They they signed a settlement agreement where where I got basically everything that I've been asking for to begin with. Okay, all right. So yeah, some unfortunate to hear some some bad blood there, but uh, yeah. And, I and guess, one thing uh, that I, I want to thank Jihan for like making Smart BCH was awesome. Like Smart BCH was such an amazing blooming ecosystem that was right around right about to spread out for the entire world. And then Coinflex 
stole all the bridge funds and just, and it didn't save CoinFlex anyhow, right? CoinFlex still went under. So they not only did they destroy CoinFlex, they destroyed the entire smart BCH ecosystem. And and really, really, uh, really sad to see that uh, happen. And uh, and I was the one there. I couldn't talk about it publicly because of the, the non-disclosure clause, but I was suing to have CoinFlex put into liquidation. And I was suing them to treat all the smart BCH funds separately like they had promised everybody they were to begin with. And if they had done what they had promised they were supposed to do and what I sued them trying to get them to do, smart BCH would still be around in a great way and in great shape and it wouldn't have had uh, the problems. The, the biggest problem smart BCH would have had is that they they lost the Flex USD stable coin. But maybe by now we would have had, you know, Tether and USDC and, and all sorts of other, you know, equivalents like DAI and things like that would have developed. But instead, Mark uh, and CoinFlex destroyed the entire smart BCH ecosystem and he got nothing out of it for having destroyed it. Like, he, he nothing. So uh, really still disappointing. And again, there's some additional lawsuits still rolling through there. So I, I won't, won't go into all the exact details, but I will tell the whole world right now, CoinFlex scammed you, CoinFlex scammed me, CoinFlex scammed the entire Smart Beach CH ecosystem. They scammed everybody. They were all a bunch of liars and nobody should believe them about anything ever again. And uh, I'm glad to be able to finally clear my name in regards to that because uh, they scammed everybody, including me, and really, really damaged the entire Bitcoin Cash ecosystem uh, by doing that. So don't ever trust anybody uh, over at CoinFlex ever again with, uh, with anything. Uh, and remember, Mark was out there lying to the entire world saying, oh, we're just having transaction backlogs. That's why you can't withdraw your money. Clearly, the transaction backlogs were a lie. And they scammed everybody by telling people that, oh, we just have transaction backlogs. Like So, yeah, that, I guess that's my rant for CoinFlex for today. I'm still really, really furious about how all that played out. Yeah, yeah. No, clearly. I mean, I was just reading up on some of uh, what uh, he's lately put out. He did an interview with Hayden Otto. And I, it's honestly a joke when you when you watch. I don't know if you've seen that interview, but he yeah. he kind of uh, just talks his way around. He doesn't really say anything. They've now started their new exchange, OpenX, and they have an OX token. Like it's just this shell game of moving things. You know, first it was going to be the RV USD classically, right? And then now then they've no rebranded scam. this RV exchange. USD, I, I was the one suing them because they owed me money. And then he's trying to sell this RV USD token to the world. And I'm not even allowed to like sound the alarm bell saying, hey, that's a scam. Don't buy it. So. Yeah. 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 And, and no, anybody uh, can look at my track record in the space, right? I've never scammed anybody here uh, and I'm never going to either. And so really disappointing to see CoinFlex uh, do all of that as well. So. Yes. And if you want to see Mark Lamb say that, He's hoping that people venting at him has given them emotional closure and that's worth something. Then uh, you can check out that interview with, with Hayden on. <laughs> okay. And I, I'm looking for the exact date, but uh, Hayden and I are going to do a follow-up interview uh, with that here shortly as well. So keep an eye out for that. I look forward to that. Hayden said that he had uh, some certain topics and limits uh, that uh, Mark apparently didn't want to discuss but uh i expect you probably won't be the same so <laughs> we'll be I, interesting I I'll to see discuss how everything except for a couple of things around the lawsuits that are still going on that i'll gladly talk about once those lawsuits are over yeah 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 no that's amazing and i think that that transparency was over many years obviously has won you a lot of fans in the community when the whole thing went down we did a there was a poll in the live chat as we did that episode where mark went on bloomberg and, and all of that and uh, yeah, every, everybody basically voted. Uh, we think Roger's in the right and, and Mark's in the in the wrong. So I don't know if that's, that's pretty any, good. Uh, when I was solace, having but... to be quiet and couldn't even say my side of the story there too. And the other side of that too, that just in, in hindsight, I, now I'm allowed to tell everybody. So there's this non-disclosure clause, right? So like, I still have a bunch of money. If I had been out there talking about it at the time, Mark could have sued me for breaking the non-disclosure clause. And I could have had to pay him, you know, millions or who knows how much money the court could have potentially uh, awarded him for breaking that. Mark intentionally and over and over and over again broke the non-disclosure clause. I could, and I did sue him for it. Uh, but the thing is, Mark has no money. He's bankrupt. So like he had nothing to lose. So that's why he was out there running his mouth, whereas I still have a lot to lose. So I, I needed to protect that. I couldn't say anything. So uh, yeah, really, uh, really. And, Another thing I'm allowed to talk about now with, with CoinFlex there too, is like another way they scammed me. At one point, I owned 20% of CoinFlex. I was one of their biggest investors. Uh, Mark sent me, a, they said they were moving the entity from Seychelles to like Grand Cayman Islands or something like that. And he's like, nothing changes with the equity structure. We just need you to sign this document. You have 20% before, you'll have 20% after, but it's in this different like entity because for whatever reasons, so like, and they sent me, I don't know, you know, 30 page long document of like real fine text. And like, 
stupid me for believing and trusting them. Like rather than reading every fine point in the, in the detail, I just believe them. Okay. I have 20% before I'll have 20% after I signed the document and gave it to them. Turned out they, they stole half my equity. I was deluded in by signing that from 20% down to 10%. Now the whole thing's worth nothing. So it's water under the bridge, but like what a dishonest thing for them to do to one of their biggest shareholders there too. They stole half my equity. And I guess I should have read, you know, all 30 something pages of the fine print or however long the contract was, but I, I believed them when they told me, oh, we're just shifting the, the the registration for the company from one country to another country. But they told me the cap table didn't change at all. That was a lie, too, where they scammed me. So, like, don't believe those guys about anything uh, for anything. And and uh, certainly don't. Uh, yeah. I, I, at this point, I have nothing nice to say about them is where I'm at. The Eduardo Sabrin strategy, <laughs> getting diluted out with the with the fine print, goddamn, <laughs> just goes to show it's all, you know history. History repeats itself. All right, so I mean, what about uh, let's just yeah, actually, one, down one the final rant too, actually on that. So like, uh-huh. what had happened? And so like, you know, I, I've invested in I don't know a hundred plus startups, and I'm trying to keep track of everything and help them all how I can. And so we filed one of these like uh, you know motions with the court in Seychelles against. Uh, claim that I'm a shareholder of CoinFlex and that I have right to do that. And so like uh, is that the, a CoinFlex in Seychelles. And then it turned out like a couple months earlier or six months earlier, I had signed the document where CoinFlex had moved from Seychelles to, I don't know, Grand Cayman Islands or some other jurisdiction. I had forgotten, right? So much stuff happened. It wasn't a big thing on my radar. And then so it turned out when I filed this motion in Seychelles claiming that I was a shareholder of CoinFlex Seychelles, I had been up until a few months earlier and then it had changed, but I had forgotten. And so then the court said something and, and the exact like wording that the, the court uses that like, you know, Roger filed a motion with like unclean hands, meaning that I claimed that I was an owner of CoinFlex Seychelles, but in reality I was an owner of like CoinFlex Grand Cayman or something like that. Um, and so then Mark went on Bloomberg and everywhere else and saying, oh, the court has already ruled that Roger has unclean hands. And I don't know if you remember him saying, Roger, unclean hands this, and unclean hands that. Like, if you yeah. look at what it was for, like, it was just a confusion as to which jurisdiction the corporate entity was in there. And then Mark totally lied and spun that around to everybody about, you know, Roger has unclean hands and the court already ruled that. So what what a, what a bunch of liars over at CoinFlex there. So, and Jihad, give me my money back. I'm going to wind up all matrix support and every matrix support customer is going to have a, a real hard time if when matrix support gets put into liquidation, if you don't give me my, my money back. Okay. Next one, Craig Wright. And he had said in writing, he was holding my money at matrix support. Sorry to interrupt again. He was holding my money at matrix support because of what happened at CoinFlex. But now I won everything at CoinFlex. CoinFlex signed documents saying they agree I'm owed over a hundred million dollars. Right? So like Jihan, you were wrong. Apologize. Give me my money back. All right. <laughs> Can we go? No, no. This is this is this is good. I just I just don't want to make you you know so so mad that this all goes completely off the rails. But uh, I think you know you you need a chance to speak your piece, and this is perfect perfect time to to and if do Jihan it. wants to come tell his side of the story, invite him on. Jihan, come on the on the uh, BCH podcast here and tell the world <laughs> why you've been holding my money for like a year and a half now. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Huang Ying, Jihan, come by anytime. <laughs> All right, Craig Wright, any any thoughts there? Uh, once again, the Mark Twain the Mark Twain quote is accurate, right? It's much much easier to fool a man than to convince him he's been fooled. Uh, Craig Wright fooled me for a while, and it was really hard. But I, I made a video saying, "Hey, I've been fooled by Craig Wright, and he absolutely fooled me, and he's fooled a number of people." Uh, the other good, and he's been busy suing people all over the world. He finally just agreed to like drop one of his lawsuits against me. I think he's like, I think Calvin Ayer is right on the verge of realizing that he's been fooled and conned by Craig too. But, and it was hard for me to admit that Craig f- fooled me as well. I, even today, I have a hard time saying he fooled me, right? Like it, it's hard to have that come out. Imagine how hard that'll be for Calvin Ayer to admit that he's been fooled by Craig after having spent yes. hundreds of millions of dollars of his own money, spending you know millions and millions on this uh, CoinGeek website. And if you think about what the CoinGeek web- website is, Calvin's been spending millions of dollars of his own money to advertise to the world that Craig is fooling him and that he's being scammed by Craig, right? So he's literally spending his own money advertising and promoting to the world every single day that Craig has conned him. And so how hard is that going to be for Calvin to finally say, you know what? I was fooled by Craig and I was fooled by Craig into spending millions of dollars of my own money on CoinGeek to advertise to the world that I've been fooled. I was fooled by Craig to spending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on mining equipment and hash wars and this and that and damage the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem with all these frivolous lawsuits. 
all because he was fooled by an amazing first-rate con man of, of Craig Wright. He's a liar and a fraud, and I'll say it again, even though he's sued me around the world, that Craig Wright is a liar and a fraud, uh, and he sued me over and over again, but I've won every single time, and I'll win the rest of them as well. Uh, and Calvin, like, I've hung out with you in person. You're a smart guy, but, and I know it'll hurt your ego a lot to admit that you've been fooled by Craig, but now is the time for you to admit. Uh, and as one of my other favorite economists, David Friedman, said, "Fooling, uh, getting fooled once hurts yourself. Or making a mistake once hurts yourself. But if you don't admit that you've made a mistake and then correct your actions, you're hurting yourself a second time. And so the longer, you, Calvin, that you refuse to admit that you've been fooled by Craig, you're just hurting yourself that much more. So now is the right time to you know, go out to the world and say, hey, I'm sorry, I was fooled by Craig too. Uh, please forgive me for having been fooled. You know, nobody's perfect. And I think a lot of people, uh, Calvin, will, will look in your direction and say, hey, Calvin, we're sorry Craig fooled you. He fooled a lot of people. But uh, we tried to tell you, and we've tried to tell you for a long time. So, uh, Calvin, you're being fooled by Craig. He's a liar and a fraud, and I'm sorry he fooled you. And I hope you can see that uh, someday very, very soon. Have Maybe you today. seen any of the, like, leaked emails between them? I, I didn't follow like every last one, but yeah, I did. I did see some of the the fireworks and those leaked emails. In yeah, I so think like Calvin knows. <laughs> so it's it's just about yeah. Once you realize that you're like that far in, trying to yeah find a way out, obviously is just so so tough for him oh, psychologically right. and you know socially and probably financially as well too. So anyway, we'll have the COPA trial in January. We'll cover that on this show and who knows what the latest uh, saga will be there. Okay, last one. Amori, what are you what are your thoughts there? I don't know. I um I I met him in person a couple of times. Uh and he's he's French and so like there's a cultural difference there between like American culture and French culture. I feel like I was never ever ever anything other than been very, very nice to him. Gave him and, uh, you know, Bitcoin ABC hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million plus. I'd have to go back and check my records. Like gave them a lot of money, lots of support, did lots of really, really nice things uh, for him and for that group. And uh, I feel like that wasn't really reciprocated or, or the the respect wasn't shown in the opposite direction. Uh, but I, I wish him good luck. I wish uh, eCash good luck. Uh, I sold my eCash. That's okay. But I wish them good luck. So Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. All right. So let's have a quick break from the drama then and say okay after all that has all been said and done we've got to this point now you know the end of 2023 taking back bitcoin is the title of the book i hope you've got something in there too about the the future and how we're gonna how we're gonna win how we're gonna turn it around we're gonna come back and maybe in 50 years time bch will be the real bitcoin and btc will be this like historical oddity that everybody looks back and thinks wasn't that crazy like how we all believed in you know covid or whatever, right uh so maybe you know that's 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 the game plan here that's that's what we're, we're doing we're, we're doing how are you see in the bch community today how are we doing end of 2023 yeah uh, without boring people too much actually unfortunately and the book would have been out already but this year i had some real difficult issues in my personal life not related to crypto at all. And so like for the last, I don't know, nine months or so, like I really missed out on a lot that, that's uh, happened. I guess cash tokens are, are live. I, I need to read a bit more about how that's going to develop and uh, the privacy tools that'll be available for that. And so like one of the things that I'm the most interested in at the moment, and I, I looked at what happened. So like initially everybody was using Bitcoin for commerce uh, on both the you know above board world and the dark net, it was all Bitcoin. And then it migrated from Bitcoin to Monero. More and more people are using, like on the dark net, it's almost all Monero. And I think more and more of that will spill over into the above board commerce because like people need to have privacy. And like cash fusion is awesome. Oh, by the way, I, I met another guy uh, recently and uh, I don't know how much I can say exactly who, so I'll be a little bit careful, but uh, he was friends with the chain analysis guys. And I was telling him, and he didn't know that Bitcoin cash had privacy tools, right? He didn't know about cash fusion. He said, no, no, no. So the chain analysis guys told me that they can they can see everything with Bitcoin cash transactions. Like there's you have no privacy. And I said no no no. If you don't believe me, let's test it. Right. So I had him give me what his deposit address in exchange, and I withdrew some Bitcoin cash from a publicly known exchange. Very clear. Put it in my Cash Fusion wallet. Let it go through. I don't know one or two Cash Fusions, uh, and then I sent it to his uh, some of it to his uh, deposit address, and then he asked his buddies at chain analysis, hey. Can you give me a report on this, like where the origins are from? And he sent me a copy of the report. They got nothing right. Absolutely nothing right. So if uh, if you're wondering how much insight uh, Chainalysis has into cash fusion transactions, 
uh, as of, it's, I don't, I, I won't say within the last 90 days, maybe a little bit more recently even than that, uh, you know, very recent, um, they got nothing right. So the privacy, uh, as far as what Chainalysis is able to see on cash fusion transactions, they got nothing right. Uh, really, really, really interesting to see that uh, firsthand. And so I'd love to see, uh, so back to where I was at talking about, we saw it go from Bitcoin to Monero because of the privacy. And then Ethereum with smart contracts and, and the EVM came out. Everybody went crazy using Ethereum, but what were they all using it for? Tokens, right? Everybody's doing tokens, but none of these tokens have any privacy at all. Everybody can see everything that you're doing with all your tokens. And so I think the next progression will be privacy tokens. And so which platform is going to wind up being the platform for privacy tokens? And that's where I'm focusing on uh, at the moment, because I think there's going to be a huge demand for privacy tokens out there. And whether it'll be cash tokens on BCH, uh, maybe it'll be that. Maybe they'll come up with different tools on top of Ethereum and EVM chains for privacy tokens. Uh, another chain or platform I'm looking at recently is Zano, I think is real interesting, Z-A-N-O, for privacy tokens. Like, I think pri privacy tokens are going to be a really big deal. So imagine when anybody's able to like mint their own token and have privacy with it. Uh, that's really fantastic. But I think BCH is in a real great position for that because it has, if people complain about BCH's privacy, they have to complain about BTC's privacy. So like if BTC gets attacked, BCH gets attacked. If BTC is safe, BCH is safe. And so I think that's a, still a real big advantage that even though BCH lost the name of Bitcoin in scaling wars, it still gets to ride on the current version of Bitcoin's coattails on a regulatory front and regulatory environment. So like I'm on this call to you from Tokyo, Japan. Monero or any privacy coins not allowed to be listed here in Japan. BCH is allowed to be listed everywhere, just like BTC is. And that's true of much of the world there. And so like, that's a, a real good thing that BCH has going forward. So, so maybe I, I know you wanted to ask me what I think. I don't know. I missed a lot, maybe the last nine months uh, with some of these personal issues. I, I'd love to hear from the community. Hey, what should I be paying extra attention to in the Bitcoin cash ecosystem that should be, uh, I should be excited about. Cause uh, a lot, I had a lot going on. I had the coin flicks, nonsense <laughs> debacle and stuff on top of that and it was just really uh took a lot out of me at the, at the time but now yeah, I'm yeah well that's the that's the best thing about uh crypto you know sometimes the same for me between about late 2017 and early 2020 i'd say i you know had a lot going on in my life i was busy with other stuff and then you come back and like it's still kicking off you know and you just uh when you've been in the game a long time you know you just read up you've slot in a couple of missed pieces and you're you're right back with it so that's the true power of, of decentralization. What about in St. Kitts then? Obviously, we had the conference there a bit over a, a year ago. We had the whole legal tender thing that may, that kind of didn't come together as I sort of half expected that maybe it wouldn't, but it was still disappointing. And we haven't heard much about that from them. Do you have any extra insight into what went on then or now maybe? Yeah, I, I guess I have a little bit of insight. I'll, I'll need to be a bit diplomatic, though, too, right? Like, I'm a St. Kitts citizen. St. Kitts is my primary home and residence. Um, I love St. Kitts. Um, but also, you know, I guess don't be too surprised when a politician promises something and then it, they don't follow through after they get elected. Like, so I, I, that's that's the short version. But BCH, still widespread. You can use it everywhere there. Come on your your next vacation to St. Kitts, a wonderful, beautiful island. Uh, you can spend, you know, Bitcoin cash just about everywhere there. Uh, I'm looking forward to a lot of you guys met Sunny while you're there. I'll, I'll be seeing him here in a in a couple of weeks. I'll be heading over to St. Kitts. All right, we've got in the chat here. Callisti is says uh, Roger literally sleeping through the BCH comeback montage right now. Laughing emoji. Last nine months have been spicy, lol. So I guess uh, yeah, you can take a look at a few a few old episodes of the podcast and do a bit of other reading. You might you might like what you see. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have liked it more though too if Jihan had given me my money back uh, as well because it was all. It, it was in BCH and then he converted it into dollars and it's been sitting in dollars for the last uh, uh, year and a half there. So the price of Bitcoin cash went from $100 to like two thirty, dollars and I missed out on all of that because he had my money hostage. And, and not a small amount of money either, to be clear. So God damn. God damn. Jihan, yeah, do the right thing here. Uh, the whole Bitcoin cash community is calling on you, Jihan. We like you, but you need to do the right thing or we'll stop liking you. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I'm Jihan, I'm definitely happy to chat with you anytime about that if you want to if you want to talk. If you want to have me on at the same time with you, Jihan, I'm I'm happy to talk about it publicly with you, Jihan. We can both lay out our case. You can you can tell the world why you've been holding my money hostage for a year and a half, and I'll tell the world why I think you've been holding my money for a year and a half. And uh, the whole world can decide for themselves who's in the right there and what what you need to do about my money. 
All right. Well, that's not something we've done ever on this show before. Not in a hundred episodes. We haven't done a live. Uh, to, be clear, maybe. <laughs> to be clear, I would be stunned if he does it. He won't do it because he knows he's in the wrong. He said in writing that he was holding my money hostage because of the coin flex situation. He said it in writing. So uh, if you have your money at uh, Matrix Port, get your money out because I'm I'm filed already filed with the court to have him put into liquidation. Okay. All right. Next. Next up, we got community comment of the week uh this one comes from peter mccormack uh another individual in crypto i know you're familiar with so he said quote thinking a lot about our not your keys not your bitcoin and the reality that for global adoption most people won't be able to afford their own utxos and transact on the base chain that a high fee environment causes many issues for lightning need to know more about scaling ideas but the big question is how can anyone who wants to use bitcoin be fully self-sovereign and not be priced out can you be fully self-sovereign without controlling a utxo is this possible is anyone working on this end quote so this is clearly just the clown world state that we're in today where peter mccormack after six years plus of shilling the approved narrative finally wonders, is anybody actually working on Bitcoin? And he knows about the Bitcoin cash community and he's called a scam as many times and so on and so forth. And the whole time we've been out there building on what he is now, finally, you know, getting to the getting to the point. Does this, what, what kind of reaction do you, do you have to this? Is this what you're talking about? Finally, they're starting to ask some questions, a few of them. Yeah, I guess this is proof, proof that, and I think even Peter said it in one of his quotes or his replies that he's a, a, a slow learner or something like that, or better late than never. And yeah, I guess better late than never. Uh, but I think Peter McCormick and you know maybe Tone Vase have been like two of the best examples of like people that understand the technology the least having the loudest opinions about it. And uh, and it's really I, better better late than never, uh, Peter. In fact, he reached out to me the other day. Maybe I'll be doing another podcast with uh, with him again. And uh, he actually told me that uh, I don't even know the guy's name, the guy that like basically pulled like a, a Borat moment on me and invited me to have an interview and, and pushed my buttons for 45 minutes till I finally gave him the middle finger. And I should have given the John middle Carvalho. finger. John Carvalho. <laughs> yeah, John Carvalho. Yes, thank you. Uh, John Carvalho told Peter McCormick that turned out I was right. Um, oh, man, that's big news. That is yeah. big news. He was asking if uh, if I want to have a, 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 a podcast or something with John Carvalho and Peter McCormick. And like I said, I'd do it if if, uh, if John Carvalho apologizes to me because I'm, I, I really regret giving him the middle finger and I shouldn't have done that. Now it became this meme all over the world. But if you watch the whole video, he was intentionally pushing my buttons for 45 minutes before I finally lost my temper with that and I, all my arguments were right and yes. you know history has proved me right and and, and credit to, to john for being able to say oh roger was right because like oh i don't know about credit to all that yet maybe he said it to peter mccormack he's not yeah. out there saying it publicly you know when people are roasting him on the twitter threads he's still you know got everyone on mute and block so he said it's not quite I, I don't there call it, for the most part i don't need toxic people like that in my, in my life but uh yes. i thought that was interesting that uh that that was the case at the moment so well i highly look forward to if you're able to get that over the line that would be a true capitulation moment and they do start to seem to be coming in uh, i've got this next slide wait, wait, here wait, 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 uh, hold on before we move on jeremy i need to know yeah so okay i think like the bitcoin will be cash phrase has been around for probably like 18 months or something now and i feel like that just finding a way to say like we own this now like yes bitcoin is B oh B cash oh oh horrible that Bitcoin would be cash oh like so what do you think of the phrase what's your I saw that you tweeted it a while ago and I was like yeah we got him like everything's on the up and up now are you are you a fan of the phrase or are you still like anti B cash uh, well I think the problem with that is that the original origin of that name is the the small block maximalist guys registered all the social media assets for B cash. And use that as an attack. And so I think the people that are hostile to Bitcoin Cash probably still own all those social media assets. And so, like, if they turned them all over to us, then maybe maybe we would be a lot more receptive to having that be another nickname for for Bitcoin Cash, or or even you know using that as as the main name. But uh, but as long as those guys own the social media assets and the people that hate Bitcoin Cash own it, it's it's really going to be a, a tough to see like it being a smart strategy to use that name uh, widely. 
Yeah, exactly. And I don't think I don't think we need to uh yeah, like double down on that that strategy for that exact reason. I think it's a poisoned well, like that's a bad, bad idea. But it is important that the community has been able to come to a point where it's not just this instant trigger word that then makes everyone defensive because then people watching the debate from outside see it and think, you know, that we're obviously wrong just because where logical arguments are out the window. It's literally just like schoolyard tactics. You know, if somebody's getting triggered, then it seems from the outside, like, okay, obviously these guys are defensive. But that stuff's like kind of falling by the wayside. And it's funny you mentioned about John Carvalho too now because, you know, that there's that famous gif of him doing Bcash, Bcash, like waving his hands around. But then now, you know, we've started trolling that in with, again, I say he's muted, uh, Certainly me, I think, and probably a lot of other people, I would I would guess, uh, because if he has his comments going there and then somebody can get that GIF in there, now it's reversed because the sentiment has come back around. So you can put it in his own thread and then everybody else can just jump in and put the same <laughs> thread. <laughs> so, you know, history... Uh, his own words against him must be pretty fun, yeah. That's right, yeah, history. You know, one day if you can just... Get in there with a huge dunk on him on Twitter with uh, posting that gift to him. It would just be like an absolute all time of classic. So maybe just just look out for a good uh, good chance for that. Uh, I think that would be hilarious. Um, right. So we've got on this next slide here. Uh, I've got one here. A comment from uh, T Dev D, who's one of the Samurai Wallet devs. And he says, revisionist history regarding Lightning Network and what it was supposed to be has now been kicked into high gear. And then someone wrote back to him, Lemon Haze at Ordinals 10K and said, Roger was right about Lightning Network all along with a little laughing uh, emoji. And I saw that uh, come up and I immediately liked and retweeted it. And then I, like he deleted it straight away. This guy, he just, as soon as I was, you know, starting to spread that around, he immediately realized it's a mistake and he deleted it. But I already had it open in my browser. So I saw in another tab that it vanished and I screenshotted it and I've got it here. But I thought this is the first example that I have seen. Uh, like you said, you might have heard a bit behind the scenes, but publicly of people really just getting to the point of like, okay, guys, we, we were wrong. And for you, especially it's, quite funny because you have been demonized and character assassinated this entire time that you're just associated with the face of bitcoin cash blah 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 for so many years that now this is maybe going to turn around and you're going to be completely vindicated on everything by everybody and get all the credit for that does what what does that feel like yeah wouldn't that be nice i i don't know if i'm going to wind up getting all the credit though to be honest uh but you know well, it you were seems, the source of all the problems, right? You were the, so... Yeah. I was the boogeyman, right? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I was spamming the blockchain and all these lies that were not true at all. Um, but I, I was ringing the alarm bell, like, don't take something that's working, working incredibly well, intentionally break it in the hopes that this new thing that doesn't work yet might come in, in to, to take its place. And that's exactly what they did. And sure enough, the new thing didn't work and they broke the original thing. And here we are, you know, eight years later, and they're starting to realize, oh, maybe the original thing was working pretty well after all. So yes, but but I, I genuinely think you know that uh, again, this because there's so many people who don't know anything about anything about anything really, and but the one thing they know is that Roger Veer B Cash bad. That's like their their that's, summary. That was the effect of the censorship, right? Anybody that came to Bitcoin after the censorship, that's all they were allowed to hear, and the censorship's still going on to this very day. And you know, I was watching some uh, news clips earlier today, like. The, the United States Air Force built a bunch of censorship tools and they were trying to like integrate them into the private sector so they could help censorship them. And then they were lobbying different private companies to adjust their, their moderation policies so that they can kick people off saying the wrong things about whether it's COVID or crypto, the government's out there trying to censor what people can say to hold the narrative that the government approves. And oh, surprise, surprise, the US government wouldn't want people to be using something that's a threat to the US dollar that works as peer-to-peer -peer cash. But having a new asset class, there's plenty of asset classes out there. That doesn't threaten the dollar one bit, but peer-to-peer -peer cash sure does. So I don't think it's a, a crazy outlandish conspiracy theory uh, to think that uh, the government would intentionally try to disrupt peer-to-peer -peer cash. And then on another, another totally unrelated note, I just want to give a shout out to people. Like it sounds crazy, but look at all the evidence about the U.S. government having had alien bodies and alien spaceships or whatever these things are for decades and been lying to everybody about it. And this uh, David Grush guy, 
go and look into that. Wow, what mind blowing stuff. Like it looks like the government's been lying to everybody about aliens. So you used to sound like a total nutcase for talking about aliens. Now you just sound a little bit like one, but go and look at the evidence. It really looks like the government's been lying to everybody about that. And I've been going down that rabbit hole uh, recently as well. It's really interesting uh, stuff and seems to be true. I will need to catch up on that one. I'm a little right. bit. I can tell you haven't looked into it yet because it sounds crazy. <laughs> Go and look into this. Like it's really, really looks like it's true and that the U.S. government's been lying to everybody about having, you know, alien bodies and spaceships and everything. And it's all just starting to break wide open now. It's really, really wild stuff, but looks to be true. So go and look into that. And you'll be like, oh, they're lying to all of us about that for decades. Maybe they were lying to us about, you know, crypto and Bitcoin, you know, needing layers and lightning and this and that as well. Like they're they're busy with propaganda all the time. But the alien stuff is really interesting as I well as the, the, the yeah. AGI stuff right on the verge here as well. I just know the one meme of that, like the alien body in Mexico, and then people put it up like, oh, you know, woke up this morning, how I'm feeling it. It's like that alien body or like, <laughs> you know, whatever scenario they were in. And then it's like, you know my face when the toothpaste runs out or something and you're like oh, this is <laughs> really good so but uh, as always memes are just the the surface layer and then you just got to got to dig in and find and out then, and look, look into so I, I was at a conference here in, in tokyo a, a month or two ago and i was talking with a a, a reporter for coindesk and uh she's like what have you been interested in recently i told her i'm researching the alien stuff and she looked at me like I was nuts. I said, no, you have to go and look into it. And it's like, it's no secret that I'm, you know, an anarcho-capitalist libertarian guy. And if in with U.S. politics, there's the, mainly the Republicans, and the Democrats. If I had to side with one more than the other, I'd probably lean towards the, the Republican side more than the, the Democrat side. Like, but what's so crazy to me, like Chuck Schumer is one of the worst senators in all of America. This guy is horrible. Yet he's out there teaming up with the most conservative Republicans and the most, you know, this guy's one of the most liberal Democrats. They're teaming up on the alien issue and all of them are realizing that the military has been lying to all the Congress people, keeping the alien stuff secret. So like for me, feeling like I'm cheering on Chuck Schumer, it feels like hell really has frozen over for me. But like uh, these, you know, and, and uh, AOC as well is like accusing the government of lying to her about the alien stuff, too. So for me to like be cheering on AOC and Chuck Schumer, it literally feels like hell has frozen over for me. But like. It looks like all the alien stuff is true. And to, to bring this all back to Bitcoin here too, one of my favorite threads on the on the BitcoinTalk.org forums back in, I don't know, 2012 or something like that, people were asking, what is your favorite thing about Bitcoin? And one of the answers somebody gave about that, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I can control my own money or I can do this or I can protect myself from inflation. One of the funniest answers somebody said, like, when we finally make contact with aliens, humans will no longer have to be embarrassed about the type of money we're using. And so that's your uh, tie back into the, the Bitcoin topic here. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Okay. And I got to ask you as well, like you have this nickname, you know, Bitcoin Jesus, which I know that you hate. So I almost wouldn't have uh, brought it up. But uh, do you have any sort of reflections on that? Because I think there's two elements to it. The first is that you say on many interviews that you would rather be known as Johnny Bitcoin, Johnny Appleseed. But I'm Australian. I'd never even heard of Johnny Appleseed until you brought him up. So if your attempts to change the narrative there, I think for anybody outside an American context, that's you're going to have to pick something different because that's never going to resonate. I guess Johnny Appleseed was a, a worldwide children's story, but may, maybe it's an American thing. I, I Never heard of and it. And so, the story takes place in America, so that would make sense. I, I didn't realize it wasn't a worldwide thing. And and yeah. to some extent, you know, Jesus spread the good, good world, good word. I've been busy spreading the good word as well. So it's... Uh, that's right. I, that's right. And it, it, it really resonates with people. You know, it's very clear what kind of person you would be when somebody hears of Bitcoin Jesus. Like they instantly connect with it. And that is a, a global story that everyone understands. Plus, you got character assassinated and now you're on the, the comeback arc. So. Rising again. Rising again. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Dude, at least make you laugh a bit. Okay. I'm glad it's a bit, at least a bit, at least a bit funny for you. Uh, you know. Okay. This is the one bit of uh, sort of uh, topical news that I thought we could uh, deal with. I've got this slide here. Episode five, the laser eyes strike back. I don't know if you followed this, but if you have or haven't, it's kind of an interesting thing. Jack Dorsey has led a 6.2 million investment round for Luke Dash Jr. of all people to launch Ocean, a BTC mining pool. Now, the key point about this, uh, not only is, you know, I guess more mining is good for Bitcoin generally, but the what's actually going on here is that the plan is that the miners will be able to choose their own block template. Now, why is that important? It's so that people who want to be against ordinals 
the sort of laserized side of the BTC community can point their hash rate it's into this pool. Yeah. yeah, and sensor off the order. I put sensor in quotes because it, Bitcoin has always worked that the miners can choose what to put in the block. So it's not actually changing anything, but it, it kind of is defeating the spirit of, of Bitcoin to be out there censoring, especially high fee paying transactions. But this is the laser eyes trying to push back on all the control that they've lost over the protocol since the discovery of ordinals and all that. So I don't know if you followed all this drama over this year, but the BTC community is now in in a bit of the, they're not quite in open civil war yet, but they're in the early stages and they have been building up over this year. So this is the laser eyes launching a bit of a counter offensive with this new mining pool, which could potentially, you know, once you take it to mining, it could potentially turn into hash war 2.0, you know, the BTC version. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts on this situation and how we're likely to see it play out or not? I don't know. I've met Luke Jr. in in person quite a few times and exchanged numerous emails with him. And like Luke Jr. is really, really smart and really, really crazy uh, at the same time. And I have experience in, in Bitcoin mining and mining pools and all that. Like that's a real uphill battle, a really, really difficult thing. And so like, I, I think uh, I, we'll see what happens, but I, I don't, I, I think that that's uh, I don't know, Jack Dorsey's $6.2 million investment is going to wind up just being a $6.2 million gift or, or burn <laughs> proof of burn. Uh, <laughs> the whole Bitcoin mining world and having an influence there. And as I saw right there on the front lines with the, the scaling war and the big blockers had more blocks being mined than the small blockers and trying to this and that, like it's a real, real difficult battle, but you know, Jack, Jack Dorsey's gotten a lot done in life. Maybe he'll have uh, more success there. The, uh, getting what he want, wants out of that than, than I did with my attempts with uh, Bitcoin mining and mining pools. But have you, have you followed this whole taproot wizards versus laser eyes civil war? Do you have a, a favorite uh, a side bit, or a take? The guy behind ordinals, like, and I'm not an NFT fan. I'm not interested in NFTs at all. And then the guy, uh, oh, Casey what, or no, 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 Udi the, and Eric. The guy, no, no, the, the guy behind the ordinals, uh, uh, he's mainly a BSV guy, actually, uh, Elon Moist, I think, is his like. All oh, right. Yes, yes. He's he's involved. He's not. Uh, he wasn't the progenitor of it, but he's he's in the mix. Yeah. He was reaching out to me, asking me if I want to make NFTs and this and that. And I was like, I had zero interest. And then when I realized, oh wait, you, you guys are making this, and it's making the BTC Maxis mad about how you're using. It. Maybe I will make some NFTs after <laughs> all. And I haven't gotten around to it yet. I was distracted with some other things, but suddenly NFTs did become a bit more interesting to me. But I I haven't had enough time to follow all the the details closely because. From my point of view, with one megabyte blocks, like Bitcoin has zero chance of becoming peer-to-peer cash for the entire world. I want permissionless cash for everybody. BTC, maybe it'll be a great investment. Maybe it'll make people a bunch of money, but it is not on the path to becoming money for the world. And I'm looking for what's going to become money for the world. And, and BCH does a decent shot at that, but the the competition is wide open at, at this point. Uh, and unfortunately, like BTC could have been that and probably could have been that around about now, but they yes. we lost years and years and years because of their stupid, stupid, stupid decisions in terms of scaling and, and rolling this out to the world. And now all the politicians are paying attention and just, you know, what what a what a what a blunder. And I, I tried to tell them and hopefully now in, in hindsight some of them are starting to realize that oh Roger was right. But uh maybe that can be, yes. be the new slogan. Roger was right. Yeah so, we already got B caches were right on Twitter. Maybe we need Roger was right in there as well. Yeah. As well to start start stacking some bodies on on that well anyway we'll we'll see how it all plays out but i think uh, especially if you get a chance to go back and listen there's episode 80 and 89 of the this podcast uh cover quite a lot of it and stuff but it's just this fascinating scenario because uh the wizards thing all emerged out of uh an accident and created this two things suddenly a, a big shift in the bdc narrative where suddenly they were like ethereum you know the whole digital gold was out the window and it was going to be nfts and scam tokens and blah 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 which some were celebrating and some were hating but the obviously the laser eyes who've been controlling the bitcoin core and the saboteurs and all that they were then suddenly on the back foot you know without having somebody sneaking one in you know into the actual repo it was just already in there and nobody knew about it and so now they're trying to sort of 
push back. But now both sides are in a bad spot because they're all in the boat together and they don't want to be. <laughs> so we're going to see. I, you know, my money is on the laser eyes to retain sort of control. I don't think the wizards are going to be able to get any. Like what, what? What would they do? Like if they try to raise the block size, they're going to cause another civil war and probably. Roger was it. right. If they do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. We've already had um, what's his name, Eric Wall, uh, got completely roasted by Vitalik on a space when Vitalik asked him, "Why don't you raise the block size to thirty-two megabytes?" And he just, you know. So anyway, that's that's some good crypto drama. But I'm looking forward to the 2024 narrative arc of uh, how that how that goes down and i guess yeah you don't what do, what do you think if if it comes to civil war who's going to win laser eyes or, or wizards um i haven't followed the exact details closely enough but uh the, the laser eyes are the original btc maxis that hate the ordinals is that the yeah 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 is that right they, laser eyes saw, we were fighting that we were fighting proto laser eyes back in the day and i saw just how dirty and what underhanded immoral tactics those guys would employ from everything from DDoSing nodes to spamming people's email accounts so they can't use it to like anything and everything they possibly can. Uh, you know, those tactics are immoral, but but they work. And so I think my money would be on the immoral dirty players there. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. All right, got to ask you about Bitcoin.com. So I don't know, I, well, as far as I know, for quite a few years, you've been largely uninvolved there despite being still the 100% uh, sole owner from my perspective and from what I've heard you say in the past, you sort of gave control, uh, you know, to the team there and just trusted them to do their thing. And you've been busy with other stuff. So you haven't really been too much in the mix. But what I can tell you is that the BCH community, I think in a lot of ways, they feel let down uh, about it because obviously it was, it's it's hard because on the one hand, you know, Bitcoin.com did so much to promote BCH and get it through the whole fork period and immediately afterwards and build loads of infrastructure and so forth. But then over the long run, the wallet has just kind of had more and more ads in there. It's now launching Verse. Things have moved on to Ethereum and so forth. And I feel like it's actually just a case of terrible timing. Like maybe Bitcoin.com jumped on the BCH train at the wrong time and now they've jumped off it at the wrong time too, as things are starting to improve for us. So given that we've had to go out and like I built the lean wallet and, you know, there's cash and eyes and the community is just so frustrated with this situation that they've straight up made alternatives at great expense and cost to get around it. Uh, what's what's really going on there? Is, is it just... Yeah, I, you know, I share your frust frustration. Uh, you know, I stepped away from Bitcoin.com a couple of years ago now um, and the, the new CEO doesn't seem as excited about Bitcoin Cash, um, for whatever reason. Uh, I'm, you know, after everything I've done in the crypto world, I'm I'm a bit burnt out. I don't want to be the CEO again. Like that was a, you know, I, I think I did a pretty darn good job growing the business and growing everything and making things happen. But uh, a little bit tired out from that. I'm uh, I turned 45 here next month. Like it's been a long road, right? I was in my uh, early early 30s when I uh, got involved in in all this, and so I blinked my eyes. The time is gone. So. Um, one thing that I think doesn't get enough credit and people haven't used and like if I was still running Bitcoin.com, I would focus on it a lot more and get the word out and do, you know, giveaways and this and that with it uh, is that shareable link feature. If you have not used that Bitcoin Cash shareable link feature, it is incredible. You can literally send a link to anybody anywhere in the world, even if they don't already have a Bitcoin.com wallet and boom, they have Bitcoin Cash right there in their wallet. And if you haven't used that, you need to start using it and you maybe build that into the Celine wallet and whatever other wallet like that is the best onboarding peer to peer electronic cash experience bar none that I've ever seen anywhere in the entire world of crypto. And uh, I think they need to do that. And if, for those that were around and remember the gifts.bitcoin.com, I tried using it the other day and it was broken. Maybe I need to complain to them again, but like they need to change those links to being the same, the same as the, the links, uh, just a QR code for the links from the shareable link feature in the wallet. That's such a powerful tool uh, for Bitcoin cash and only cheap UTXO uh, chains have the ability to do right. that. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's such a great feature that I think people don't realize how powerful it is. And I'd love to see more people using that. It is. Been... Been... I, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to come back as the CEO. I, the, the, the idea had crossed my mind if I had a bit more energy and if I did want to come back, the thought had crossed my mind also maybe, maybe sell the Bitcoin.com domain name, but keep the business itself and then just yeah. Because there's a great product, there's a great ecosystem there, but we're promoting Bitcoin Cash. The thing that everyone's calling Bitcoin at this point isn't that. And so the domain name, 
you know, I don't know what Jack Dorsey or uh, what's that other guy, uh, the MicroStrategy guy that's another uh, blog. Michael Saylor. Michael Saylor, who doesn't really understand the technology at all, but boy, is he a good orator and, and good at, you know, whipping up a crowd into a frenzy. But uh, Get you know, a few mil off him that. and uh, reinvest that somewhere else, you know. And then reinvest that into the peer to peer cash ecosystem, right? So, because, uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay. All right. So we can't, yeah, can't expect any uh, great change there from them anytime soon. And I mean, I, that's, that's fine. You know, I feel like the BCH community needs to fly and put in its own work on its own terms. And then as we start to see success, well, that will be a compelling case to them just as with everyone else to kind of get back a bit more on the, on the same track. It is, it is disappointing, but at the if end of the day, get, if we can get smart BCH somehow back on track, then I think you'll see a lot more because the, the EVM stuff is where so much action is happening in crypto and yeah. Bitcoin.com as a business needs to earn revenue as well. I'm I, like everybody else. I'm sick of seeing those verse ads like, okay, you can put a banner somewhere, but don't have pop up after pop up. And it's really gotten uh, frustrating for me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of people probably feel that way. Uh, but uh, if we could somehow get smart BCH back on track and if you guys have ideas or suggestions on how we can do that, uh, I think that would be a, a pretty good step for the, the whole Bitcoin Cash ecosystem, and really, really disappointing that Mark and Coinflex stole the the bridge funds for, for no justified reason, and and I don't know for sure. I'm just speculating at this point, but like I I sued them in Seychelles to try and get them to treat the Smart BCH fund separate, like they were supposed to, yeah. and the rulings from everything out of, of Seychelles were so strange that like I have no proof, but I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future it came out and like you know there's a leak somehow that CoinFlex somehow bribed the judges in Seychelles to get them to rule in their favor because their rulings were so strange, uh, strangely in favor of, of CoinFlex there. Um, so again, I have zero proof of that, but I wouldn't be surprised if that came out at some point. Yeah, yeah. I just want to touch on the, so the shareable link thing, you're right. That is one of the most, you know, it's a very highly requested feature. And I've heard many people I know, uh, Bitcoin Jason, who does tremendous work, onboarding everybody in town so that is his number one favorite feature by far yeah. and and whatever he likes you know that it's fucking useful because he's out there day after day after day so and we are going to try and get that at some point most non-bitcoin cash people and even some bitcoin cash people don't know about that like i talked to some of my other like crypto friends that have been in the space for a long time but they're not focused on bch they don't know about it and i send it to them like wow that's awesome why don't more people know about this so uh so send us send a shareable link to your your friend that's already in crypto and show them how it works because i think that's such a powerful tool yeah yeah definitely and we will yeah it is on the selene roadmap but there's just 50 yeah. other things as as always and it's truly not a trivial feature to build either too it's very slick how it uh deep links you straight into the app and downloads it and then deposit the funds like that's not a trivial thing to set up in a non-custodial way and where you can claim the funds back and and all of that so it's really you know that's it's a powerful feature but it's also not a simple one so it's it's simple to use but not to implement basically um okay. you know so hats off hats off to them so I, the, I have a question for, for for you guys though like what yeah if, if we go back and talk to the you know the bitcoin.com team what feature do you guys want to see for bch in the wallet that's that's missing currently well, that's the thing. I think the, from the complaints that I've mostly seen, it's not that people want more features. They want less features. They want less ads and also less of like, you just want to be able to just switch off all those other coins. I think you can adjust that a bit, but like, just why am I in here worried about Verse and Ethereum? And I don't care about any of that. And that's fine. Some wallets are multi-coin, but from what I've seen, like the demand, the reason we built Celine and Cash and Eyes, why are they succeeding? It's because it's BCH only. And that's what people want. BCH is pretty, you know, BCH. Like people don't really care too much about it all because they know it's all the trading and whatever. They're just focused on their cash. So that's that's it. People are also asking in the chat for cash tokens, uh, which yeah, definitely. Like the thing is that's 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 a that's a big jump, you know. If they're going to get into cash tokens, I highly recommend they do. The ecosystem's already coming together nicely there, but it's going to it's it's a BCH only, so it's not going to be relevant to any of the other stuff they've got going on. And the tooling is still it's getting there, it's improving fast, but it's still pretty uh, germination kind of stage. So I, I should look. While we're on the chat right now, I, I just I just texted the the wallet team asking if they have any plans for cash tokens on the roadmap. And if they reply while we're still on the call here, I'll I'll let you know. So. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Hopefully we we'll, we'll get an update on that. Okay. I've got question of the week. This new segment that we've started 
Uh, this one comes from Queen Ofiuka G underscore Relit says, not sure where to put a new question of the week, but I have one. Where can we spend with BCH? Not using intermediaries like BitGree, that is. Spending with BCH like Monero Market or similar. And I did actually look into, I at least Googled it to find out what is Monero Market, but it didn't come up anywhere. So maybe it's one of the darknet markets. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I, have- I don't know what Monero Market is, but uh, uh, I, I assume she's asking about online. If it's offline, you know, take a visit to St. Kitts or Argentina in Buenos Aires has huge Bitcoin cash adoption as well. Take a look at map.bitcoin.com and Slovenia as well. Huge, huge Bitcoin cash uh, adoption. These are for physical shops. And then online, I don't know, there's a, like a million plus uh, uh, BitPay merchants, I think. I forget the exact number, but some huge number. You can pay with BCH, all those. I, I you know, buy domain names at Namecheap with Bitcoin Cash. Uh, there's all sorts of places there. So, yeah, take take your pick. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird question because it says not using intermediaries like BitGree and Purse and that kind of thing. And even so the BitPay stuff, like that's almost sort of falls into that category. So I feel like really the answer is onboard people around you, which is not easy to do necessarily, but that's by far link. the most... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Send us a shareable link. By far the people around you. And the best thing is people that you have a personal connection to who are running a small business, I've found, because exactly. they're the ones that are most open and to thinking about it. Because if you're like their mate or whatever, and you pay them with it one time, they will support. And this is we've heard about this before from other onboarders, they will support it just because they have a relationship with you, even if nobody else cares about it. And at the yep. same time, that will give them the experience and it will sit in the back of their mind and they'll think, yeah, maybe there is something to this. And then in a year or six months or whenever they get interested, then they will come back to you for more info on it. And then you can go from there. And especially if it is a business that you go to you know, frequently, you might be in the position where you know other regulars that are there or, or what, what have you. And then you can also spread it to them. And then the business owner sees that happening. And then you build up a little community because then the third person you onboard. That exact situation exists in St. Kitts. You have all these merchants that are taking Bitcoin Cash using that. That Bitcoin Cash register app shouldn't be underestimated as to how useful it's a tool amazing. that is for, for yes. physical adoption. And a lot of people don't know about it. There's a web version as well. If you don't want an app from the App Store, you can go to POS, like point of sale, dot cash, and you can use a web version of the exact same thing there as well. And you see this all over the place in St. Kitts where people can you know, pay in Bitcoin Cash and the merchants are liking it. Everybody's liking it. It, it works so well and you're, you know, have access to worldwide payments from little tiny islands in the Caribbean. It's really a powerful tool. Yeah, simple and effective. And I, I was personally, you know, very impressed by my time in in St. Kitts. It's got to be, yeah, the most crypto adoption in the world, probably. Um, not, well, it's still, it's not in Slovenia as well. And then I haven't been to Argentina for a long time, but uh, I hear rumors that there might be another Bitcoin Cash conference happening uh, in Argentina here sometime next year. So, uh We'll see what happens with that, but uh, I'd love to meet a lot of you guys in uh, maybe Argentina the next time. Yeah, just to just to touch on that quickly, we had this week uh, a bit of drama over some BCH conf in quotation marks. This people came out of nowhere with a website soliciting to buy tickets for a fake Bitcoin Cash conference because there are you know discussions ongoing like with Argentina and potentially some other stuff too, but it's all still in the sort of discussion phase being coordinated behind the scenes. And then somebody was like, oh, time for me to try and run a scam. So if you are seeing any BCH conf tickets, don't buy any. And if you see any in the future for any other real conferences, don't trust Verify. Do your research. Before you send your BCH, you're not getting it back (laughs) if you send it off to some scammers. So really just double and triple check that it's an actual real event uh please before you do because this is just inevitable and it's a sign really that the scene is growing that people are like really oh there's money here there's real consumers so time to time to run a bit of a scam okay i've got a few other questions that i just wanted to ask you a little bit a little bit crypto a little bit not uh just just things i've always been curious to know really so quick answers or i mean you know i guess answer as as much or as little as you want You've said in the past that business is just moving things from somewhere less valuable to more valuable. Can you expand or give any other entrepreneurial or business advice? Sure. So here's an example of this. So this is um, some Japanese tea I bought here. 
I think I paid 150 yen for it, uh, which is like about one US dollar. And the reason I bought this for, let's call it one dollar, is because I value the tea more than I value the dollar. But the company that made this tea values the dollar that I gave them more than the, the bottle of tea. And so like, you know, I'm drinking this here while I'm on the call. This is great. They've helped move this tea from, I don't know, the water where they got it and the tea leaves from somewhere else, from out in the you know woods somewhere into my house. But another example of that, here's the bottle cap for that tea, right? Wow, this is made of plastic. So they moved the oil out of the ground somewhere into a refinery and the refinery, you know, sold the, I guess, molded it into a cap and then sold it to the bottling plant for, for the tea company. And the bottle cap, this oil that used to be oil sitting on top of this bottle is now worth more than the oil when it was in the ground. So it's just moving it from where it's worth less to where it's worth more. There's all the all the parts that are in my iPhone here. They moved them from all the way around the world individually where they were worth a little bit less to now it's in an iPhone where it's worth way more. That's all anything and everything is for any business is you're moving things from where it's worth less to where it's worth more. And there's a fantastic essay called I Pencil, or you can watch a YouTube video called I Pencil that explains like those sorts of details. Like it's amazing the amount of effort and collaboration from people all over the world go into making things as simple as a pencil or a bottle of tea. But all of those things are people moving those resources from where they're worth less to where they're worth more. And uh, it's, it's, it sounds so simple, but if you stop and look at it and even, even like, you know, software businesses, you're moving the time and effort and labor from doing something else to where it's worth more and more people can take advantage of it. And all these AI developments with a, you know, writing code and like I think more code on GitHub now each week is being written by non-humans than humans. Like this is a real oh, damn. Wow. point yeah. in civilization. It's really, really about to change in a big, big way here. So then, yeah, it's like you say, it's moving from where it's worth less to where it's worth more. And once you understand the mechanics of an economy, that's that's simple. But the I think the harder part is how do you how do you find how do you know you're onto a winner? How do you see that opportunity that something could be from here to here to make money? So that brings us right back to cryptocurrency. It's the money. It's the prices of things. It's when when someone's willing to pay you to do something, that shows that they value it. And if you're willing to do it, that means you value the money more than the the item. And so, like you know, for example, out in the living room here, there's a TV. I valued the TV more than the money that I paid for it. The the TV store valued the money uh, that I paid them more than the TV. So now both of us are wealthier after we made the trade. And the TV store bought the TV from the TV factory and they paid some lower amount of money to the TV factory. But the TV factory valued the money more than they valued the TV. And then the TV factory bought all the components for the TV with money. All the component manufacturers valued the money more than the components to make the TV. And the employees that were working at the factory, they got paid for their time at the factory. They valued the money more than they valued their time at the factory. So everybody at every step of the ch- of the chain here that's exchanging things voluntarily, they're all better off after the trade happens, otherwise they wouldn't make the trade. But the thing that's allowing these millions of people around the world to collaborate with each other to make something as simple as a a bottle of tea or a TV or a pencil, it's money. And the money transmits the information as to, you know, should this plastic bottle be made of plastic, should be made of wood, should be made of aluminum? Like, we don't know until we have a pricing system. And the pricing system transmits that information to, you know, if the bottle should be made of gold or, or plastic or whatnot. And so the more easily the money can flow around the world, the more effectively everybody can collaborate with everybody else to produce the most things for the most people at the lowest cost all around the world. And that's why peer-to-peer cash is so incredibly important because it allows that information to flow more freely. If that information can flow more freely, then the entire world can progress much more quickly than if governments are blocking the flow of the money for this and the flow of the money for that, and they're wasting time for this and wasting effort for that, and they're preventing the world from becoming as prosperous as it otherwise would have been. So that's why peer-to-peer cash is so incredibly important. And so it's so incredibly frustrating that the adoption of peer-to-peer cash for the world has been delayed by these scaling civil wars and everything else because it's just like compound interest is amazing, compound economic growth is amazing too. And so we've missed out on a number of years of having the benefit of peer-to-peer cash for the world. That time and that growth will never come back because it's compounded year after year after year. And uh, that's water under the bridge that's never coming back. That's economic growth that we're never going to recapture uh, to where we could have been if we had had that all those years uh, along the way. So it's so incredibly important uh, to have the free flow of, of money around the world because it transmits the information to allow people to collaborate more effectively. And everyone likes to say, oh, capitalism is you know cutthroat competition. 
Yes, it's competition, but it's competition to see who can cooperate the most effectively. So it's a competition to cooperate. And that's what makes everybody better off all over the world. And so it's a real important concept that they certainly don't teach you in, in government school. But uh, go and watch the, the YouTube video called iPencil to get a grasp for just how amazing the pricing system is to allow people to cooperate, to compete, to cooperate, to produce everything that we want all over the world. Yeah, there we go. So find or make something and then find a way to get it to somebody who values it a lot more than you do. And I'm sorry, to answer your question directly, it's, it's the price that someone's willing to pay for something. So if you can buy something for $100 and sell it for $200, that's a signal, oh, you should do more of that. But if you can buy something for 100 and people only pay $50 for it, that's you're moving, then you, you're doing the opposite. You're moving it from where it's worth more yeah. to where it's worth less. So you need to figure out what you can buy for less and what you can sell for more. And the pricing signal is what, what gives you that. So you can go and, you know, contact some factory in China and see what they're producing and then look on your local Amazon or eBay or Craigslist or Gumtree in Australia and see what that same thing is selling for. And if it's selling for more, buy some of it from China or India or whatever, you know, factory in your local town, it doesn't matter. And then turn around and sell it for more. And you're moving things from where it's worth less to where it's worth more. Yeah. Simple, simple, but effective, I guess. <laughs> Easy to say, hard to, hard to implement. Okay. What is one question you wish interviewers would ask you, but they haven't? And what's the answer? Is yeah, that's a harder one? question. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll have to think about that and maybe get back to you in the future. Okay. I'll, I'll tweet about that. I, I don't know offhand. Okay. All right. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? So um, before we started filming this day, we were talking a little bit about jujitsu. And yes. actually, I think the best piece of jujitsu advice I was ever given, and it took me maybe a year or two to figure out that it applies to all of life, not just jujitsu. But uh, somebody in jujitsu told me that, like, if you're not sure what you're doing, doing it harder probably isn't going to help you. And like in jujitsu, that's very, very true. Like if you don't know what you're doing, doing it harder is not likely to help you. But it, it after thinking about that for a while, I think that's kind of true in life. If you're not sure what you're doing, doing it harder isn't likely to, to have the effect that you want. And so that's why I think it's so incredibly important to like read books and educate yourself and have this additional knowledge. So then you can apply that knowledge to the strategy of whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. And it's like doing things really hard. Like that's great. I'm all for trying really, really hard to get whatever the goal is that you want. But if you're not sure what you're doing, doing it harder isn't likely to, to have a, you know, a, a better effect there. So go and spend the time to, to give yourself the knowledge and, and the, the information so you can have a, an effective strategy so that you do know what you're doing. So then when you know what you're doing, you can do it really, really hard and effectively at the same time. And so not only does that apply to jujitsu, I think it applies to all of uh, life, but it was somebody in jujitsu that gave me that advice. And uh, I thought that was really great. Yeah, I think that's funny. The context is I did my first ever Brazilian jujitsu lesson uh, earlier. Well, yesterday. Now it was a few hours ago. And what you're saying there is exactly what happened because in my third little uh, sparring rolling match, the the guy who was clearly, you know, more experienced and better than me, he started out, he just, you know, he was sitting down and he was in sort of a defensive posture. And so I just stood there because I know that I'm a noob. So I know that whatever I do is going to create a weakness. So my strategy was to be reactive, but so was his. So now we're just standing there and I'm kind of like, well, I, I feel like the burden should be on you to make a move because uh, I don't know what I'm doing so i'm definitely going to do it badly i think <laughs> that's funny that's uh that's very true to life okay <laughs> if you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead who would it be i don't really feel much of a need to have dinner with anybody because all the interesting people that they wrote a book i can read their books reading their book is having like a multiple hour long tutoring session uh with that person so you know, go and pick up some of these people's books that you're interested in the ideas. And luckily I've had the chance to have lots of interesting dinners with lots of interesting people. But uh, yeah, I, and some of the books that have really influenced me, of course, you know, various Austrian economists, uh, Murray Rothbard, of course, uh, Louis von Mises, another uh, a person that's still alive whose book really influenced me a lot was uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, The Age of Spiritual Machines and the Singularity is Near and like uh, just what an interesting thinker. And I, I, I got the benefit of uh, meeting his son at one point but uh i would love to have a dinner with uh, ray kurzweil i'm sure there'd be lots of interesting conversations to be had uh had there and if uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention and i think most people in the crypto are but like this uh the the singularity is near like uh this oh, ai revolution is right there upon us it's really really incredible where where things are getting to at this point okay all right i mean there's plenty of people in history that haven't written a book i guess maybe just the boring ones i don't know like this has well, every we interesting person 
if they're dead and gone and they didn't write a book and even if they did a bunch of interesting things like you won't really know about them you know the i guess so if you're doing something interesting maybe write a book about it or make sure it's documented in some way as well (laughs) other advice fair enough okay and what is the best behind the scenes bitcoin story that nobody knows i can't say that nobody knows but uh one that's kind of a I don't know, I guess a fun piece of early drama is uh, uh, there's another early, early Bitcoiner a guy named uh, Amir Taki who came up with like Dark Wallet and he was helping with 3D printed gun stuff. And like a lot of the stuff he's interested in, I'm interested in too. And he he calls himself like an anarchist and like, I'm okay with calling myself an anarchist too, but I feel like these were like totally opposite anarchists. Like I want law and order. I just don't want it from like on high uh, I, I want you know natural law and uh, voluntarism, and I want my my house to be in order. I want my hair to be cut. I want to shower on a regular basis. I want you know to treat people you know friends and family kindly. I think drugs should be legal, but I don't want to do drugs myself. Uh, whereas Amir Taki, I feel like just like the the chaos chaos anarchist. And so in 2012, I think it was, or maybe 2013, there was a lot of buzz in Bitcoin about this uh, website came up. I think it was like the Bitcoin card.com or, and it was called like mycelium or something like that. And it was really a really slick marketing vi- video. And it was like a little uh, size, of maybe two credit cards, like thick and the size, not letting a credit card. It was like supposed to be like a peer to peer Bitcoin wallet that would let you send and receive Bitcoin from this little on your card. It was really amazing. And so the guys behind that invited me, Charlie Shrim, Eric Voorhees, Amir Taki, and maybe uh, Ira Miller and maybe one or two other people out there. Cause we were like the, you know, kind of the spokespeople for Bitcoin at that point, they invited us out to Austria to go and like, see what they were up to and what they had built. And we got to see the prototypes of these devices. And it was really interesting. Um, and they paid for us to go on a Segway tour, like those little two wheeled scooter things uh, around Austria. And it was really fun, interesting tour. And like myself and Eric and Charlie and all the other, you know, people, I don't think Eric would shy too much away from calling himself an anarchist as well. But like, we all had no problem staying with the group and following the tour guide lady, who was a very nice lady explaining us about this and that. And we're going all over the town. Everybody could stay with the group except for Amir. He could not stay with the group and he would always go off on his own on the Segway thing. And like the lady, the first, you know, five times was very nice to him and said like, Amir, I need you to stay with the group. Please stay with the group. We don't want you to get lost. Like, please stay with the group. And I don't by the fifth or sixth time, she kind of really let him have it and said like, hey, Amir, you need to stay with the group, right? And then uh, eventually at some point, like uh, there was some girl with a sign that said free hugs. And like, you know, okay, free hug. But like Amir hops off his Segway and goes to give this girl a hug. But like a Segway, you have to like power it down properly. You can't just jump off of it. But he just jumped off of his to give this girl a hug. And the Segway then now has no rider. The Segway goes driving off by itself with nobody on it, goes across, I don't know, like four lanes of traffic, almost gets hit by a trolley car, and then crashes into a tree on the other side of the street, tips over, and the Segway is gyrating and shaking all around. And like, you know, the Segway doesn't know what to do. And Amir sees that that happened. Any normal responsible person would say, oh, my God, I, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have jumped off. And he'd run over to the Segway and try and like, you know, re- uh, turn it off or power it down or, you know, try and help the situation. What does Amir do? He literally runs away. He just runs down the street and leaves the Segway gyrating there and just, just full on ran away. And then this lady powered down her Segway, runs over there and like powers down the other Segway. And she had to call somebody from like the Segway rental shop to come and pick that Segway up and bring it back because there's, you can't drive two Segways at the same time. And uh, just really, really irresponsible behavior for he like literally just plain ran away and uh, I like some of the, the ideas that uh, Amir's had and some of the things that he said and done and built. Like, they're great, but, like, that's not the way you should live your life. If you make a mistake, don't just run away away, away from it. Like, uh, try and, you know, solve the situation. And, like, I don't think he, you know, crashed the segue on purpose, but running away was not the right decision there. And so uh, that's an interesting character. And there's some interesting documentaries. Like, he, uh, I don't know, went and fought against ISIS with, like, some female fighters in the Middle East or something. He, such an interesting guy, but not not the lifestyle that I want to live. He was like squatting in different buildings in in I think the UK as well. In London, and like, I've seen some of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really interesting guy, but like not not the way I would like to live my life. And uh, it was kind of interesting when he literally ran after crashing the the Segway. He ran away 
Uh, Tough enough to fight ISIS, but not the lady running the Segway <laughs> tour. All right, exactly. uh, fair enough. You know, dark. Well, it wasn't wasn't set helping him out with when it got got to her. All right, I've brilliant. Got, uh, <laughs> I've got an off the wall kind of question. I've uh, yeah. seen this one work amazingly on Kill Tony, and I'm hoping it does well here too. What's the weirdest thing in your fridge? There's not too much in my fridge, actually. I'm not here. Uh, the weirdest thing in my fridge. Uh, there's some. It's not in America. Maybe it's slightly weird. There's some tofu that's about a month old, but it's still sealed, and I think it's still fine. I have to check the date on that. So that's. Well, I don't know some weird Japanese Japanese drinks that maybe they don't have in the rest of the world, but yeah, not too exciting. Sorry, swing and a miss. <laughs> got to try anyway. <laughs> and I got one more question, which is, I believe about two years ago, maybe maybe a little bit longer, when Elon Musk got really into crypto for a bit there and tesla bought some and he was shilling dogecoin on his twitter constantly and so forth now that's all faded out a bit because the whole grand experiment crashed and burned because he listened to the btc guys rather than doing bitcoin cash so more's the pity but at that time i believe a bunch of people asked you whether you had talked to him about crypto because he was saying that he talked to a couple of people and got some advice kind of kind of deal now when you were asked about that if i'm remembering this right you said look i'm going to just decline to answer which is very rare for you to do is am i remembering this right and if so can you what happened there were you talking to elon about crypto yeah um i guess enough time is, is gone by there so uh i spoke to to him um, I think he understands real well, and he's clearly a super, super sharp guy. I don't know what his current intention is. I haven't spoken to him recently. Um, the funniest joke around uh, around that, though, was you know I, I spoke to him for about maybe ninety minutes, and one of my other friends, uh, after I hung up, you know, on the call with him, he said, "Roger, that was very generous of you to give Elon that much of your time." So <laughs> I thought that was a pretty funny joke, but uh, I'm not sure where his head is at, at the moment, and I haven't spoken to him since then. Right, so he does. Know, he knows about the split and the history and all that. And if he's not going for it, the, that's... Thing, Mike, he's the richest guy in the world and arguably the most famous guy in the world. So many people are vying for his attention and time, you know, every single day. And crypto yeah, yeah, is yeah. Just, and, and crypto is important. Don't get me wrong, but like you know, he's building the brain interfaces and you know, focusing on you know large language models to compete with the woke versions from you know Open AI. And you know, he has all this Tesla stuff and SpaceX and like so like he's pulled a million different ways. And like I've had a bit of a, a taste of that from just my own, you know, notoriety from my involvement in crypto. And it's draining and exhausting and really, really like, you know, difficult on a number of levels. And he's on a whole other level in terms of that. So like I wouldn't want to bother him about anything, you know, at all. And I hope he, you know, enjoys his life because look at all the amazing things he's done for the world so far. But uh He's also, uh, I enjoy his sense of humor quite a bit on, on Twitter and that sort of thing. But I'll give him a, a word of caution, though, too, because, you know, to the best of my knowledge, you know, he's never been to jail yet. I love what he's saying, but he's he's risking a lot there by, uh, by you know, poking some of these politicians the way he is. So, uh, you know, please be careful, although I, I do support him. And if it, the more he wants to poke, you know, I'll, I'll be I'll be rooting for him. But <laughs> so watch out. These people, you know, if if uh, if someone says something mean and nasty about me. Okay, if you say something mean, mean and nasty about a politician, they try and send you to prison or worse. Yes. So, uh, so that's the difference. Right. Jeez. Okay. All right. Well, you know, that's certainly an interesting thing to know because, because you know, the community is speculating. Does Elon, does he not know or is he not looked into it? He can't be this stupid. He can't know. I, I, get, I agree with you. I think it probably mostly just comes down to he's too busy. He got some advice. Bitcoin was the biggest one. He said, let's do that. Let's see how it goes. Didn't work out, and he's had other problems. You look at all the arguments that he made for for Dogecoin. All the arguments he made for Dogecoin were the, applied exactly to to BCH, yes. and like one, one like B, Dogecoin has lower inflation than uh, than BTC as well. Has faster, cheaper transactions, and like once BitPay integrated it, which they already did, it has like similar like merchant adoption to BCH as well. But you don't have like the the hate and the vitriol from the BTC maximalists against Dogecoin. And then from a regulatory standpoint, like a regulator looks, they're wrong to try and prevent Bitcoin cash, but at least like you can see, oh, a regulator is scared. You know, here's peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world. If a regulator is trying to say, they're using Dogecoin with a dog picture on it for a currency and we want people to prosecute them, they just look like an even bigger idiot for doing that. So like that's one other thing that Dogecoin does have going for it in, in that respect as well.
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll see. You know, I'm hoping, holding out hope that at some point he has, you know, a free week. When would that ever happen? Or he catches his interest and he does a bit of a deep dive because that that's the thing. He's the, probably the single most influential person on the planet, and he could tip the scales seemingly at probably any time if he if he really really wanted to. If he was convinced, we got to flip BDC, and he could he could probably do it. So. Anyway, uh, just uh, just who knows when that'll happen. Okay, we got uh, meme of the week as we're coming towards the end of the show. This one comes from Almaz Dust, who has made a meme, Jessica Abla. So he made a, uh, what's it called? Photoshopped GQ cover with Jessica Alba on the front, but Bitcoin Cash themed because the adaptive block size limit algorithm, which will be going on, in the May 2024 upgrade has now sort of locked in and the community is getting hype about that. So he's made this whole thing with Jessica Alba to catch your eye and then maybe to read a little bit the uh, adaptive block size limit, where to BCH, what to BCH, how to BCH. I thought this was a very clever usage of uh, just like the Salma Hayek uh, quotes that Sal the Agorist is always uh, putting out. So I wanted, and the community responded well to it as well. You know, everybody thought this was kind of funny. So I don't know, is this your style of humor, Roger? And what do you think about the adaptive block size limit? Are you up to date on that? Yeah, you sent me the meme. uh, So I have it open on my screen here. But like, I I have to admit, like, I don't even know who Jessica Alba is. Um, (laughs) That's a girl on on the picture. Like, I like. Yeah, she's she's a model. She's just famous as a model, basically. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, not, not, I guess not my thing, it, nothing wrong with it, but I just, I don't know who she is, but uh, adaptive block size limit. Fantastic. Let's go. Like maybe. And, and one thing like the BSV guys really did have, right. I think like in, in words, like not in actions, but like build a stable platform for people to build on. That's not constantly changing and constantly having everybody have to, having to rebuild everything. And so like uh, I'm looking forward to, to that being the case for, for Bitcoin cash, get the, something that's ready to scale to be money for the entire world, but a stable platform for people to, to build on. And that's that's one other thing that I think a lot of these Bitcoin maximalists still don't notice in hindsight. They're like, oh, you can't have a hard fork because it'll split the community. Are you blind? The entire community split because you didn't have the hard fork, right? <laughs> like, how can you not see that today? All these guys say, oh, you can't have a hard fork, it'll split the chain. You split the chain into you know thousands of altcoins now because you didn't have a hard fork to upgrade the block size of Bitcoin. Yes, yes. Well, it's just like you said before, it's a few malicious actors, see the narrative, and then the rest of the idiots just uh, repeat it uh, blindly. And, you know, anyway. The ones that understand it the least are the ones that are the loudest usually as well. Yes, yes. And of course, well, they're also the ones who are able to appeal to the other ones who understand it the least because they're they're on the same level. So that's just the universe, you know, law of the universe, karmic law of the universe. Okay. Final segment that we do on every episode of the show, message to the community. So just in your own words, what story, point of view, anything, feedback, message does the Bitcoin Cash community need to hear? It's up to us, right? There's no CEO of Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. So let's go and spread peer-to-peer cash to the world and use it every chance you have. Anytime you need to pay anybody for anything, try and pay them with cryptocurrency, uh, and then take the, the fiat currency that you normally would have used for that transaction and buy more crypto with it. And the more we can do that, the faster this will spread to the world and the sooner the politicians will have less control over all of our lives. Yeah, that's it. It's up to us. That's it in one sentence. Love to hear that. Okay. All right. Final slide, the supporter appreciation. Thank you very much to our donators. Thank you to our patrons, Ricky and HP. Thank you to our sponsor, General Protocols. Check out BCH Bull. Dot com. Thank you to our Flipstarter contributors. We just finished our third Flipstarter. Majumalu Marcelo, Molecular, Shadow of Harbringer, Turek, Emergent Reasons, Imaginary Username, Cheapy, Cheap Lightning, Pat, Mini Satoshi, and Sandaka's man, Marius, uh, all donated at least half a BCH to get on the mentions, and a few other people donated as well. So thank you all for that. It was a slightly more ambitious ask than my previous ones, and I'm very gratified to have it uh, funded. I will be doing a sort of special piece of content to say thank you to the Flipstarter contributors. I'm not going to spoil any more about that, but we'll get around to that 
at uh some point and yeah thank you everybody for the faith and believing in the show it's been been great having you on board it's been a great 100 episodes so really glad of that everybody who's watching you can check out the start guide faqs links at bitcoincashpodcast.com if you're brand new to the show check out episode 85 and shout outs final word roger who do you, who or what do you want to give a shout out to just want to thank uh, you guys, the hosts, and everybody listening for helping to spread peer-to-peer cash for the world because that's one of the easiest things and best things that we can do to make the entire world better for all of us. So let's uh, let's keep spreading that message until uh, the AI overloads take over everything. So <laughs> <laughs> that it might not matter, right? Jet shoutouts. Yeah. So my I've got two shoutouts uh, shoutouts for this episode, and the first one is to you, Roger, for. Uh, like introducing me to cryptocurrency. I think you were one of the first people that I saw spreading the good word back in 2016. And I was like, okay, I'm in. Um, and the second one is to you, Jeremy. We've been going at this. If I think, like, I don't know what episode I started doing the production on. 26 but you, yeah. it would be. So you've done 75 episodes. Yeah. Pretty and, amazing. It's been, I just am appreciative of the opportunity and uh, I'm glad that I also get to earn a little BCH while I do this, so. <laughs> yes, and likewise, my shout out's going to go to you, Roger, for being Bitcoin Jesus, even if you hate the name and uh, the decades of, well, coming up to decades, but the more than a decade of, of work on the whole project and the amount of people that you've introduced is incredible. When you go back through history, the number of people that credit you as the direct source of their inspiration or how they truly got onto the Bitcoin message is absolutely unparalleled <laughs> by anybody. So that's absolutely amazing. And you've just lifted so much uh, weight in the community. It's been incredible. So thank you very much to that, for that. And Jet, my thanks also to you for doing these shows constantly uh we're pretty good about scheduling them regularly and uh you know it's not not exactly like it's a small commitment to be doing two hour shows plus the juicing and editing and all the stuff that goes on in the background as well too so very happy to have hit 100 episodes and i have in myself also reflected on the next 100 episodes going to be really interesting because uh, this has been about three years and the last, you know, things tend to be exponential. So if the size of the show keeps growing and also as AI begins to sort of take over everything, it might start to get kind of weird, but hopefully weird and wonderful. So I think that'll do it for the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And until next time. So I started realizing that if you can just find strength just a little bit longer, you will have a crew of people following you along the way. And that is another thing that no one can ever teach you. Because you, you're going to have to learn that on your own. You're going to have to figure out how to pull that energy out of your mind on your own. There's, not, there's, there's no book you can read that all of a sudden I have it. I've got the technique now. I know how to do it. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, a grind that you have to start and finish on your own.